Hello, hello, dear fellows. Uh, uh, wonderful to have you with us. I'm Ali Aslan. I'm an international TV presenter and journalist based both in Berlin and uh, Istanbul. Uh, I had the pleasure of moderating the EU panel yesterday and uh, great pleasure now, obviously, to round up the Rizina dialogue with uh, uh, debates on the geopolitics of Eurasia. I gotta be honest with you, when I first uh, received this request to moderate this session, I, I thought geopolitics of Eurasia, that uh, let, you know, even to start to define what Eurasia means would probably take up uh, all of this time. If you're gonna be very uh, particular about the term, you could start from Portugal all the way to Indonesia and perhaps even further, but of course, uh, for, for the purpose of this particular discussion, we have uh, distinguished speakers here uh, who are all experts in the field of Asian studies and Central Asian in uh, particular. Uh, to my immediate left, is uh, the, he's the Assistant Minister and Director General for South Asia at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, of Iran, Syed Rasul Musavi. Wonderful to have you uh, with me. Uh, also with us is Eldor Aripov. He's the Director of the Institute of Strategic and Regional Studies in Uzbekistan. Wonderful to have you uh, with us. Uh, also, uh, warm welcome to Kairat Saribay, who's, who's the Executive Director of the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia, based in Kazakhstan. Delighted uh, to have with us uh, Alicia Kizekova. She's the head of the Asia Pacific Unit uh, at the Institute of International Relations in the Czech Republic in Prague. And last but certainly not least is Francois Nicolas. She's the director for the Center at the Center for Asian Studies at the French Institute of International Relations. And uh, full disclosure, since we started uh, at least 30 minutes late, Francois actually has to catch a plane uh, and has to leave here, it has to leave here quarter two. So Francois, I'll be coming to you very soon. Uh, let, let's open it up uh, fairly quickly. Obviously, uh, as I was saying before, Eurasia, you can, uh, this entails Afghanistan, this entails Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkey, China, Russia relations. Uh, all, each of these uh, could and have uh, been a panel in and of itself. So, um, but we will try to make sense of it all and try to have a comprehensive discussion here nonetheless with your questions, of course, as well, Mr. Musavi, let, let me start with you uh, briefly, uh, because obviously the Rizina dialogue was overshadowed, if you will, dominated, but also overshadowed by the war in Ukraine. And to get uh, to address the elephant in the room and get this topic out of the way, obviously Ukraine, Russia, in the, in the mo most specific sense, also part of Eurasia. Um, th this is a war that's been going on for two, two months now. Your country, at the, the uh, vote at the U UN General Assembly to denounce uh, Russia abstained from the vote, have called for negotiations instead. Um, give us the thinking, uh, give us the perspective from Tehran when it comes to the war I in Ukraine. What is the way forward and what do you specifically criticize about the so-called Western approach? Thank you very much. Uh, you know that uh, the main issue that invited me to talk about Afghanistan, but yet <laughs> this is and the- we'll get to that. Yes, yes. Uh, but about your uh, direct question about uh, what my country said about uh, this uh, uh, tragic events that happened in our region or in the, for, for the region. So I can say that the main issue that Iran said that the West is responsible for uh, doing something against uh, Russian uh, security interest. So when uh, Russia had uh, done anything against uh, to limit the situation, to keep its national interest, so it, it's happened. Iran it was uh, fully against the war against Ukraine. Iran supported the, the uh, uh, national uh, security, national integrity of uh, Ukraine, also the uh, independence of uh, Ukraine, and always emphasize about this point. But at the same time, say, and invited both countries to find a peaceful way to talk about this issue, and also my minister always called both sides, and also talked with, uh, uh, recently he talked uh, to minister uh, foreign minister of Ukraine, 
and invited both sides. But I am saying that Iran criticizes NATO and Western countries because they didn't pay attention to the national and security interests of Russia. Mm, so the, the NATO expansion, quote unquote, towards exactly, Russia's border exactly. is what you're criticizing, is what provoked, in your opinion, uh, this war. Of course, it, it, this is something we can discuss uh, throughout this discussion when I come to you. But uh, let me turn to Eldor Aripov here for a second. Uzbekistan, of course, part of the former Soviet Union. Of course, uh, Russia is, is a country uh, where, where you share uh, cultural heritage and, 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 and the language and so on and so forth. So this is a war, this is a dilemma, this is a situation that you, of course, also in Tashkent follow closely. Give us, give us the view. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, to be part of this. Uh, I'm not sure if your mic is the microphone. Yeah, it's on, on. on. yeah. Part of this distinguished panel. Of course, uh, what is happening uh, in Ukraine <laughs> is at the center of attention of Central Asia, too. It is uh, widely discussed in the press, in social media. Uh, it, uh, most of the countries of Central Asia express their official position. Um, but we have to understand that uh, Central Asia and Russia actually are connected by thousands of visible and even invisible threats. Uh, what are these threats? Uh, just to give you one example, uh, labor migrants. Uh, more than 7 million people from Central Asia are working in Russia. Each year, they're sending home about $8 billion, and it's quite substantial source of uh, foreign financing for the countries of the region. Uh, I would say that even for some countries, it, this figure outnumbers um, volume of direct investment and donor funds combined together. For some countries, it's substantial a part of the uh, national uh, GDP, for example, for Kyrgyzstan, it is more than uh, 30 percent. Um, another factor is uh, trade. Russia is the uh, leading trade partner for all Central Asian countries. It's number one trade partner for Uzbekistan. Our trade is about $7.5 billion, and it is about 18 percent of the t uh, overall trade turnover of Uzbekistan. Uh, um, <coughs> through transit, uh, two-thirds of uh, all exports from Kazakhstan goes through Russian ports. So uh, it's quite a complex issue. Mm. And uh, when, when we're talking about reaction from Central Asia to what Ukraine, we should take into consideration these factors too. Absolutely. Uh, the the uh, uh, many factors that play into this war, the ramifications uh, wider so I think are painfully clear and, and uh, uh, the awareness is, is sing, uh, singing through uh, each day even more so. Francois, uh, be, before we lose you, before we lose <laughs> you without you having even said a word, <laughs> that, that is something I desperately try to avoid, which is uh, be before you board the plane and leave this uh, beautiful city of New Delhi, uh, uh, the, as a director of, uh, Center uh, at the Center for Asian Studies at, uh, of the French Institute mm -hmm. of International Relations, obviously you have a dual, dual um, perspective in a sense. You obviously have the European one, but most importantly, your uh, field of expertise uh, is Asia. Is Asia. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, uh, that would be also my question. H how do you think the, this, this war that we keep talking about uh, for the past three days here uh, is affecting the region? Well, there is one first side effect of this uh, conflict in uh, Ukraine, and this is the I very negative impact that, that it has on the Belt and Road Initiative. Okay, if, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is all about connectivity, but there is, well, it's not only about physical connectivity, but it is to a large extent physical connectivity, at least as far as Europe is concerned. And the BRI is, in particular, a long railway crossing Kazakhstan, then Russia, then Belarus, Belarus and then to all the way to Poland, and then Germany, and eventually France, so even Spain. And there is another uh, route, another leg of this uh, Belt and Road that goes through Ukraine. And as a result of the conflict, well, the route through Ukraine, you can forget. And the route through uh, R Russia and Belarus is also in deep trouble. So one first impact is this very, very negative impact on the Belt and Road Initiative. And this is something that very few people talk about. But if you look at the reality, the reality is that this railway that had been that had become extremely uh, 
well, it, it, it worked extremely well, <laughs> to be honest. You know, but we were uh, we tended to be extremely critical in uh, <laughs> in the EU about this uh, this right away. But it had become very, very, uh, well, very efficient for Chinese exports towards Europe as well as European products going back to China. So it it was a success story, to be to be honest. And this is no longer a success story. Mm. So this is one very direct impact of this. Uh, uh, of this conflict on the, this major initiative launched by uh, Xi Jinping in Kazakhstan, by the way, in 2013. And Kazakhstan is, of course, what brings me to Kairat Saribay. Uh, 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 Saribay, of course, uh, uh, Kairat, the same uh, what I said to uh, Mr. Aripov about uh, being a former part of uh, the Soviet Union, sharing a cultural heritage, sharing a language, sharing a border, um, is, is of course something that is very much applicable and true for your country, for Kazakhstan as well, a country that's been going through some domestic turmoil at the beginning of this year, certainly didn't help matters, but now we have a conflict that is Im impacting not just Asia, but the wider world. G give us a sense from Nur Sultan uh, about uh, how you see things develop and how your country and Central Asia is affected in particular. One and a half years before I could probably answer in my national capacity. But as I'm heading the international organization, I have first to recognize that I'm speaking here as a private person. All my uh, ideas, all statements, all remarks will be in my personal capacity, will not binding any of 27 member states of SICA that I do represent today. So I think that uh, as Kazakh citizen, definitely it's a very much tragic event. And uh, I discussed with some of my colleagues here in Delhi as well that we live in extremely hard time. This is the new era in the international relations and many other things. But I said that I entered into the Kazakh Foreign Service 30 years before. And these 30 years, we experiencing constantly the crisis management. First, we had to create the new country. That was a challenge. Second, we had to manage a multiple threats because we had to foster. And uh, we came to the result of all our internal discussions, how we, can, we could manage the longest border across Kazakhstan, because it's the ninth territory in the world, with very modest population. At that moment, it was 15 million. So the 5,5 five individuals per square kilometer, can you imagine the, the length of this part? how you can protect your sovereignty, how you could can protect your independent way of development. Only through diplomatic means. Only being part of the international community, only with the emphasis on multilateralism. So we are in India. We know that India initiated non-alignment movement along with some other nations. Nowadays, what we see, India practicing the multi-alignment policies, which is great. But in both cases, we need definitely multipolar world. And I would advocate here maybe the multilateralism, because this is the way how we can get out. Connectivity is a part of multilateral, multipolar. So the SICA, what, which I do represent here, where, let, let me say, where, where I'm working now. Mm -hmm. So the main idea of SICA is to promote connectivity, which probably will create the confidence, will create the trust. And then we can talk about cooperation and with cooperation development and security and many other things. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, of course, for pointing out that you're not speaking uh, as the executive director 
uh, of the conference on interaction confidence building measures in uh, Asia that's very much understood. W uh, very lovely to have you with us here o on the panel. And multilateralism, Alicia Kizekova, is of course uh, a term that also applies uh, to your field of uh, work uh, as the head of the Asia Pacific Unit uh, at the Institute of International Relations at the Czech Republic. Uh, I know Russia-China relations are very much on your mind, are a big part uh, and a uh, big part of your work. Uh, um, China's position here in this war is very crucial, is very crucial, of course. It's uh, quote-unquote support it has lended Moscow up until uh, now is, is uh, what perhaps uh, lends the confidence uh, that Moscow needs in order uh, to keep uh, the, this going. So, so my question to you is, mm, how reliable, how reliable is this support? How reliable is uh, this uh, is this relationship, this Moscow-Beijing relationship? Is that something that Moscow could build upon, or should is this something that could be more fragile than Mos uh, th that than Moscow would 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 like to believe? Um, good evening, everyone, and glad to be here. Uh, in terms of Russia-China, uh, it's been uh, advertised as uh, strengthening uh, after or during this conflict. I actually uh, personally believe that this uh, intervention of Russia showed how very different they are, uh, how inco incompatible they actually are, because uh, from my study of this relationship over the years, I've noticed Russia resorts to force and, and uh, doesn't respect territorial integrity and uh, China is more cautious. I think China is using more smart power and Russia hard power. And I think China was uh, patient with Russia over the five-day war in Georgia. There was obviously the situation with Crimea, but now we are in a full-scale conflict. I was bro brought up in Czechoslovakia. We have a very vivid memory of uh, Russian invasion. And uh, I have to say, I feel like I'm dealing with a country that's stuck in a different century. For me, if we talk about who's going to win this war, I think the Russian leadership has already lost the war because it lost the hearts and minds of lots of people who were taking Russia more seriously. Uh, in terms of China, I think it's a not good situation because China, as Francois pointed out, has a long-term vision for connectivity and doesn't have any control over the situation. It's, it creates a situation of unpredictability, which they don't want to see. Uh, what is also interesting that Russia uh, failed in s subscribing to some of the principles. As we mentioned here, multilateralism, I study Shanghai Cooperation Organization, BRICS and all this, they all have in their guidelines that the state should not get into conflict with force, destabilize, or actually even try to get uh, military superiority over others and respect territorial integrity. All of this has been breached. So I don't understand how we can trust Russia trying to communicate when it doesn't know. And I think China pays attention to this as well because it's, uh, it's very cautious of how it's perceived. And um, being aligned with Russia in that regard does not work very well, I think, for their personal national interests. So I think this, the situation with Russia and China is an ongoing project. I mean, they've developed a stronger relationship. They now have a new military agreement um, for joint exercises. So they, the, this trajectory is working. There is another element that people can talk about who are part of SEO. There is the de dollarization using national currencies that's been now even more enforced. And I think this kind of projects that they share are strengthened now and they will continue. So it's not something that just happened overnight. It's been 20 years in making. So we are building on something that is ongoing. An interesting point that you're raising that even if uh, Russia and Putin were to win, quote unquote, this conflict militarily, it, it will lose so in terms of soft power, in terms of influence, in terms of cultural reach within the region. It has lost the hearts and minds uh, of the region. Uh, Mr. Musavi, I do want to speak to you about Afghanistan, obviously a subject matter very much on our minds, but with your permission, being mindful of the time, because I know that Francois has to leave in nine minutes, and, and I do want to get you in one more time, Francois. Uh, usually, uh, we don't start with conclusions, but I'm actually going to give you the floor now to, to before, before you leave us, 
to uh, give us a little bit of an overview as much as you can within the short amount of time, obviously, about how you see Asia, Asia developing, particularly perhaps India. We are, of course, in New Delhi. We heard very, um, we had very strong statements from the foreign minister uh, throughout this conference and emboldened uh, confident uh, India that uh, wants to and will uh, play a much more active role in international affairs. How do you see this unfolding? No, but I'd, I'd rather not talk about India in, <laughs> I, in, in India. And I'm uh, definitely not an India specialist. But I want to go back to what uh, Alitza was saying about the Russia-China relationship. I very much agree with her that uh, this relationship is perhaps stronger, more solid than uh, many people think. And, thi and the reason, well, there are two levels to this relationship. And this is, there is, of course, the uh, Xi Jinping uh, Putin's romance. This is a very short term thing. This, this may not last. And uh, once uh, Putin is gone, because at, at, at some point he will, he will go, I guess, and he will go certainly before uh, Xi Jinping will. Uh, so once thi this romance is over, perhaps you know, thi people may think that uh, things will change. But I'm not sure. Because there is a second level, which is much longer term. And this relates to what uh, Alisa was saying. This is something like a 20-year relationship. And this very strong relationship has built over time. And this uh, very strong relationship is built on an anti-Western feeling. And this is very, very strong, I think. And th so this is, I guess, what is really uh, kind of uniting them or putting them together and cementing the, uh, this friendship. So I guess we, we should not uh, overestimate the relatively short-term thing and the uh, just uh, yeah, pu Putin, Xi Jinping's romance. I mean, this is much... This had much deeper roots, and so I, I, I guess that's why this, uh, this relationship is much stro stronger or more solid than we, we uh, so sometimes think. So, of course, this will have uh, a huge impact on the rest of Asia. Uh, you see, if, if China is emboldened, this may change a number of things, and uh, among this number of things, uh, there is, of course, the Taiwan issue, and there is a stability in the rest of, uh, of Asia, and there will be more tensions between China and its neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. So this may, this may have a huge impact on the, on the rest of Asia. Mm. Uh, rest of the region, of course. And Francois, I, I think... Uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm, uh, I'm afraid I have to go. I, thi <laughs> I think you have to go. Now, thank you so much. So I'll we started late, of course. We started late, uh, which is I'm why... I'm sorry for that. Uh, no, no. Uh, at the end of the day, this, this is how it goes. Uh, planes don't wait for us. But uh, Francois Nicolas, it was wonderful to have you with us. Thank I think you. we give her a round of applause. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. And... Uh, have a safe trip back to, to Paris uh, with the old and new president. Um, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Musevi, let, let's talk about Afghanistan here. Obviously, uh, a country uh, and a re that has sort of disappeared from the headlines because of the war in Ukraine, but where the conflict is still very much ongoing, the uh, overthrow of the government and uh, the takeover of the Taliban was major news, at least for a brief amount of time. Uh, now it seems, even at this conference, uh, uh, more or less, that Afghanistan has somewhat disappeared. But I think we're ignoring that country and that region at our own peril. Isn't, isn't that the case? I mean, at the, at the end of the day, we need to pay much more attention to what is ha happening in, in, in Kabul at the moment. Uh, thank you very much, again. Uh, let me I first I say that uh, I had a tweet about my judgment on about this uh, uh, rising of dialogue, and I said that Afghanistan is the in the under the shadow of Ukraine <laughs> issue, and I said that because of the Ukraine was the main debate in many uh, session in this uh, rising of dialogue. Afghanistan went to the end of the all debate. Though we see that in the practice, we t are talking on Afghanistan in this uh, um, uh, session. But let me, uh, because Afghanistan every day have a, a new pheno uh, phenomenon, new development, let me, I, I only frame a big picture exactly at this time what's happening in Afghanistan. I think that it is important. I think that Afghanistan is uh, pondering between a pessimistic uh, viewpoint and, their rea uh, and uh, optimistic. And now we should find a realistic approach what's exactly happening in Afghanistan. I only want to title the four 
uh, challenges of Afghanistan at this time face Afghanistan with four main challenges. And also at the same time, Afghanistan have uh, four uh, main uh, opportunity. The m four main challenges are uh, security challenges. I don't want to go to detail and ex express that. Security challenges, political challenges. What, when I am saying that political challenges, not internally, but internationally. No country until this time ne recognized uh, Taliban as a uh, official state, as a legitimate representative for the uh, people of Afghanistan. Another uh, security, another uh, problem or challenges for Afghanistan is the economic challenges. I think that it is familiar for all of us. And the social challenges. You see that, for example, the uh, banning the girls go to school, uh, what happened about their women rights, and many, many other things. So we see that these are the four main challenges at this time. Afghanistan is faced for that. But at the same time, Afghanistan has four main opportunity. The first, uh, uh, I think, that opportunity Afghanistan has, at this time, there is no exact real opposition. You know that, yes, there are many people are opposed uh, against Taliban, many g groups are sh uh, shaping on the, maybe on the future, but at this time, there is no real opposition, mainly in the uh, different. And if we have, for example, National Front or another, these are the ethnic groups rather than the all ethnic group. Another challenges for this, uh, another opportunity for uh, Afghanistan at this time, there is a kind of consensus in regional and international try to assist Afghanistan to go out of this crisis. You see that, for example, in neighboring countries, until this time, uh, Afghanistan neighboring country organized uh, uh, three in the level of uh, for a ministerial uh, meeting to uh, tackle this issue and to find and uh, send a message to international community also uh, try to s uh, talk with Taliban and to normalize the situation. And I think that until this time you cannot in the history find like this Afghanistan neighboring countries we had a meeting in Islamabad, we have a meeting in Tehran, and the, uh, recently we had a, another meeting in China. I think that the third uh, important uh, opportunity for Afghanistan is that uh, uh, everybody thinks that Afghanistan is a reality on the ground. It is important. Reality. Everybody wants to talk with Afghanistan. When they say that what we can do, this is the reality. So it is another opportunity. And at the fourth opportunity, I think that uh, is that for Afghanistan at this time, there is no external intervention. Because if you we, we look at uh, for international, after the withdrawal of the uh, American uh, troops, where there is no intervention is inside Afghanistan. So uh, let me I conclude what, what I am saying. I am saying that Afghanistan faces with many challenges, four main challenges. Afghanistan at the same time has four main opportunity, but the main issue for, uh, this Af uh, for Afghanistan, I think that for Afghanistan is their own decision inside Afghanistan. It is for Taliban decide what ca can do to talk with his people, to, f to, pr uh, to uh, be honest about what promise in the negotiation time. If Afghanistan, if the Taliban accept the reality, I think that they can pass these challenges. If not, is then they will uh, uh, they will live in the ch uh, uh, challenge. Uh, indeed, I, I think th that foreign intervention does not really work in Afghanistan. I think has been proven over and over again. The Russians. Of course, experienced that up until 79, 20 years of Western engagement where the Taliban was replaced by the Taliban, you know, at, at the end of the day has also seen that all the developments that supposedly were made throughout these two decades are now being uh, backsliding once again. Thank you for pointing out the challenges and indeed it remains to be seen 
uh, whether the Taliban can also reinvent themselves and become a Taliban 2.0, for, for lack of a better term, which we, which we keep hearing. Uh, but but uh, l let me turn to you again, Mr. Eldo Aripov, and, and we're talking, of course, about Eurasia. And there I want to uh, dive a bit deeper into Central Asia here, uh, a region that's still, in, in the Western world at least, still uh, overlooked, perhaps even misunderstood. Um, Kazakhstan, obviously a big country, your own country, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, if, if you want to come, Mongolia as, as, as part of it. Um, tell us about the challenges, knowing very well that we cannot speak of a comprehensive Central Asia, having just named the countries and knowing that they're distinct uh, uh, approaches uh, and leadership. But what is the comprehensive, what is the common challenge for, for that particular region? How can Central Asia make its mark in the 21st century? And, it, and Uzbekistan, of course, your country in particular. Thank you. But if you will let me, I will just uh, add some words about Afghanistan. Of course. I think it's very, very important. It was mentioned that Afghanistan right now is on the shadow of uh, Ukraine. And I believe it is a very dangerous situation. We should not repeat old mistakes. We should not leave Afghanistan again one on one with its own problems. We should not again isolate Afghanistan. Uh, it's a very serious humanitarian crisis right now in Afghanistan. Even according to UN, 95% of the population in Afghanistan is malnourished. And we need to involve we, we should be very pragmatic, very realistic. We have a uh, government there which controls the situation. It's accomplished fact. And we should be very pragmatic as, as much as possible. And we should involve these people into constructive dialogue. We should explain them what are our requirements. But our dialogue with them should not be carried out uh, in a way uh, like demands, punishment, etc. We will not achieve any results by this. We should also encourage positive steps. We should also encourage positive changes. And uh, regarding uh, Central Asia, I believe uh, right now Central Asia is uh, developing, changing uh, for better. Just five years ago, there were so many internal issues, unresolved uh, border issues, unresolved w water distribution issues, inter-ethnic conflicts. During these five years, with the political will of all five Central Asian countries, we were able to resolve a lot of problems. We uh, resolved a lot of problems between Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan on uh, delimitation of the border with Tajikistan. We uh, uh, reached some compromises on water distribution. And because of this, we were able to open borders, restore transportation within the region. Regional trade is now booming. You know, people could easily visit each other, their relatives, their friends. Uh, from Tashkent, you could visit all capitals of Central Asia by plane, by train, by bus. It was impossible just five years ago. But uh, the main question is what to do next. And again, in this context, I would like to mention Afghanistan too. We are talking about regional cooperation in Central Asia, but we are also talking about connectivity between Central and South Asia. I believe this concept which was presented by President of Uzbekistan two years ago could really give new impulse for the economic development, for the political developments in the very close to each other regions, Central and South Asia. Unfortunately, in the past, all these contacts uh, have been lost. Now we're trying to uh, revive all these contacts, not only in, uh, in trade, in economy, but also in culture, in education, etc. Of course, uh, we would not be able to do this without direct transport corridors. Unfortunately, 
Right now, we do not have that. That is why we're working closely with uh, Iran, with India, in order to uh, implement corridor which will connect uh, Central Asia through Chabahar with uh, South Asia. And we're also working with Pakistan in order to implement project which will connect um, Termas, border town with Afghanistan, with uh, Mazari Sharif, Kabul, and Peshawar, and will, which will give the shortest access for double length Central Asia, access to the uh, sea. Uh, you know, right now, if you would like to take one container from Pakistan to uh, Uzbekistan, it would, will take you about 35 days. This railroad will be able, uh, will enable us to bring this container during three days. The price would be uh, half cheaper. Uh, it was just a month ago, there was a really historical event. Uh, one Indian businessman uh, brought two border town termes in Uz to Uzbekistan, 104 tons of Indian sugar. His route through Mumbai, through Pakistan, through Afghanistan for the first time. It really shows that there is huge demand for such kind of corridors. And these corridors could really untap huge potential in economy, in energy, in transport, etc. So political differences must be overcome and cooperation must be enhanced. Kairat Saribay. Eldor Aripov is optimistic about as far as the future of Central Asia is concerned as a not homogenous bloc, but certainly a harmonious bloc that works together in order to uh, enhance the prosperity uh, of its people. W do you share that optimism? Interestingly, I do. Because uh, I'm going from the positive agenda because I'm a multilateralist. Uh, I remember discussions in Berlin as uh, BRI started to implement. Uh, you, you might remember that uh, President Xi announced uh, the economic belt of Silk Road, which is the uh, land part of uh, Belt and Road Initiative, in Nur Sultan. Why? Because Eurasia or Central Asia, by the way, it's very great to discuss. Uh, for instance, my Uzbek colleagues, they would prefer to call our region as Central Asia. But Kazakhstan has two cups. One is Eurasia, because physically we are binding Europe and Asia. And we are part of Central Asia. So coming back to the positive agenda. Uh, we have conflict. As I said, 30 years, as my country declared its independence, we continuously struggling with different uh, kind of uh, <coughs> uh, crises and challenges and threats. Sorry. 30 years before, the first president of Kazakhstan proposed the idea to invite all Asian nations <coughs> to discuss and to create the mechanism of cooperation for the security, for dialogue. People said, oh, it's a dreamer. He just appeared at the uh, UN uh, General Assembly rostrum and offered us something unrealistic. We in Asia, we are so much diverse. We have so many nations in conflict with each other. But how, how we managed, and in 2002, in Almaty, we agreed to act, to interact together. We engaged in the first ever pan-Asian platform where, you can imagine, Palestine, Israel, Iran, Pakistan, China, India, and many others. Now we are 27. So I desperately invite all <coughs> my colleagues <coughs> to think positively. Yes, uh, up and set in the global history. But we had also many tragic events in some other places. We're talking today about Ukraine, which is absolutely uh, deserved to talk, deserved to seek the diplomatic solution. 
because we have no way. We can only, in diplomatical means, reach the peace. But why are we talking only about one conflict? Afghanistan is quite important. Important for Asia, first of all. I remember the wonderful international conference in Tashkent. I participated to that conference last year. It was exactly before Taliban uh, took over the, the, the Kabul. Very unfortunate. But we agreed. I, I will I, I understand that I am restrained. Just a few moments, it was agreed by all 26 Asian uh, states that restoration of peace and economic development in Afghanistan based on an inclusive negotiated political settlement is key for security and stability in the Sika region. Sika region means 90% of Asia. Emphasizing the rights of all Afghan people to live in safety, security, and tetra, and tetra. So it should be not a safe haven for terrorists. It should exist, prosperous Afghanistan should exist in harmony with its neighbors. And uh, the gender, the, inc uh, the human rights, uphold the human rights, including those of women, children, and minorities. So that was the consensus on Afghanistan of 26, and we have to continue. We have already this approach, and we have to continue because Asia should perform the good way, in a good faith, the good example of multilateralism. By the way, talking about Russia and Ukraine again, we should also took a de take the deep analysis why it happened. Why? What was the main reasons? Why are we only talking about the action on the ground? What was before? What was, which kind of discussions were before? In the OEC, for instance, I was the permanent representative of Kazakhstan to this organization. I remember that these very robust actions was, however, discussed a, a decade. Right. Decade. So we have, we have to talk about in a positive way. We have to, to take care about the others' opinion. And, and I think it's perfectly understood that uh, we, can, we cannot afford uh, whether values overlap or not to exclude or, or overlook and ignore Afghanistan, events in Afghanistan, have to bring them uh, I into the international community as painful as it may sometimes uh, be. I do want to come to you, of course, give you a question. I'm being mindful of the time, 20 minutes left here. So if you do have questions, get ready. But I do want to bring in uh, Alicia once more here before we open up. Uh, China, China again, I, I have to uh, raise the issue, is of course uh, a global player. The, the, I think if anything, the, the Ukrainian war perhaps also is, is rattling the international community because it shows that the unipolar uh, rule of the United States uh, once and for all seems to be over here. Um, give us the sense of how we are still, and by we I mean in the West, you're based in Prague, I, in Europe, in the United States, how are we still misunderstanding China? I think, um, uh, well, that's complicated because I think it goes two ways. I think China also doesn't understand us very well. <laughs> so when I started dealing with China in Central Europe through the 16 and 17 plus one f frameworks, I spoke to Chinese uh, visitors often and they grouped us into this block uh, without understanding the differences in our part of the world. Slovaks, Czechs, Polish, Hungarians, we are different. So you can't always uh, use the same formula for everyone. So it goes two ways. And another part is that I think misunderstanding is that China, I think even with the current vision, works with this like brainstorming way of dealing with how they're going to approach the world. They suggest an idea and they wait for response. And that was the part when the delegations came from China to Europe, they were suddenly talking about big investments and we had this uh, business forum in Hungary in 2011 and they saw there was a hunger for investments from Eastern Europe. Obviously we're going through Greek financial crisis, then Brexit was uh, going on. So countries wanted to get some investments and China, China liked it. It was a business mind. And then in Warsaw, a year later, we had 12-point plan and then suddenly everybody was on board with big committees and organized every year summits. 
and European Union was very confused that China is dividing us. Uh, my argument is always European Union doesn't need China to be divided. You know, we have our own ways of being divisive. But um, that was one of the problems, that there was not an understanding. China creates this, uh, like with SEO, it's a very, uh, I would say, organic way of approaching uh, things. And, and we talk about it here, uh, even in the previous panels, that we have certain way of looking at norms and the rules-based order, and then we say we only work with like-minded countries, then we limit collaborations. And, and I think that's no longer possible. Afghanistan is a great example. It's a uniting factor for all partners. So this is the same with China. China is trying to create these um, east-west corridors, and then south and north. It's, it's, that's the idea. It will go as far as we, we let China go. But countries seem to fall for these big promises, sign up to memoranda. But the question is never, there is never analysis, I think even in Central Europe, we never had analysis of mapping how these investments will work. It, it just was a lot of hype. And now we are quick at uh, saying, well, it failed. And suddenly we are working with Taiwan in Slovakia, Czech Republic, big promises again. And, and we don't understand, let's say, the Taiwanese-Chinese relations, how they are interconnected. So I think we jump to quick analysis without going deeper, looking at the economic effects. I study China-Australia relations. You can see there was a lot of criticism change of legislation about interference. But on the other side, the business deals were going at the same time, and Australia was getting some revenues while also working on uh, AUKUS uh, collaboration. So the business and the politics were side by side. And um, in Europe, you also have countries that are very pragmatic in uh, looking at China, business community versus political sphere. So I think we don't have enough time to really engage in understanding each other. And uh, China's approach is very different from ours. Uh, it's not as direct. So that's part of the problem. So, so the lack of uh, understanding isn't a one-way street, uh, quite on the contrary. Uh, Europe also very much misunderstood by Beijing, uh, if I understand you correctly. We have 15, uh, 14, 15 minutes uh, left here in this discussion. I'm, I'm do seeing already three, four hands. Uh, how about this? Why don't we, I'm seeing more hands as, as I speak. Uh, why don't we do it this way? We all collect. We collect questions. Perhaps we can uh, jot them down. So uh, I don't do two rounds because realistically speaking, uh, that's probably not going to be possible. So why don't we start uh, right here. Introduce yourself quickly. Do we have a microphone? Uh, yeah, you have the microphone. Perfect. You're already uh, strategically placed. There you go. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, my name is Hatice Çelik and I'm an academic based in Ankara, Turkey. Very nice to hear your uh, perspectives actually here in uh, India. So my question is, uh, I'm sorry if I have already missed the news, but uh, it was very like uh, busy after the, the Ukrainian war. Maybe I already missed the um, developments, but what was the reaction of the organization of Turkic states uh, to Ukrainian war? Actually, the Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Turkey, and Uzbekistan are the members. Uh, they they made an explanation uh, or they showed the reaction to the Ukrainian war or uh, they stayed more like silent on this issue. So my question uh, was that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, we are obviously don't have much representation from those countries here, but perhaps uh, we'll find out an answer nonetheless. Strategically, I'll, I'll come to you. We'll, we'll go table by table. Otherwise, I will lose sight. Please be brief in your questions. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. So some of the, uh, some of the explanations were mentioned about uh, Afghanistan. So uh, there, wa there were some criticism for the Afghan, pr Afghan president that he didn't fight and that he left the country so quickly. So my question is, where is he now? And why is, uh, why I'm, he I'm is not sure anyone has that information on the stage. But, uh, why, why he is not commenting on what's happening in the country? Yeah, uh, again, I'm not sure. Any, well, perhaps someone has a direct link to him, but, but we'll find out. Um, last, last time I checked, was he in Abu Dhabi? I don't know. Go ahead. Uh, this one's for uh, Minister Mousavi. Um, so one of the f very few areas that the United States and Iran agree about was the threat of ISIS in the Middle East. And I was wondering, is Iran concerned about um, ISIS-K in Afghanistan? And if so, um, has Iran uh, engaged the Taliban on this subject? Over 
Thank you so much. Uh, passing on, going to that table now. I'm coming to you. This is the second table, third table. I'm do seeing the hands. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Me? Yeah, okay. please. Uh, hi, I'm Shifan Yang. I'm a German journalist. So um, I'm very grateful for uh, uh, your um, remarks on how uh, the BRI has not basically delivered so many results in Czech uh, Republic because I have been in uh, Prague myself in 2019 to go after the exact same question and uh, it seemed like at least in Czech Republic um, BRI was more like a Fata Morgana than anything and uh, more like a brilliant um, uh, marketing exercise. So my question goes to the rest of the panel because I learned that the train from Iwu to Tehran basically ran only once and then never again and that the biggest dry port of the world uh, it's called like that, and in Korgos um, is handling way less uh, trade volume um, than planned, and this might have changed with the pandemic and the rising fees for sea cargo. Um, and uh, yeah, for Uzbekistan, I don't have such a clear idea, but um, yeah, my question is, um, does the BRI deliver any real benefit um, at the moment, or is it also like a Feta Magana in your countries, like in a Czech Republic? Okay, thank you so much. Train that only one runs once and never again. Sounds like the Berlin subway. Go, go ahead. G g give it. Yeah, please. Um, hello, my name is Jakub. I am from Poland. I have two questions. The first question is to Mr. Musavi. I wanted to ask you, I mean, I think it's a bit a rhetoric question, but could you name any country from Europe, apart from Armenia maybe, whose people have ever wanted to live under the Russian uh, sphere of influence. And I have my second question to Mr. Saribay. Uh, maybe could you just like briefly give us like very good reasons why Russia attacked Ukraine? Because honestly, I am from Poland. I am like really thinking a lot about the, the whole issue and I cannot find any good reason apart from like imperialistic sentiment of the public and a huge series of fake news. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the, the, the reasoning actually has been, we don't necessarily subscribe to it, but I think the reasoning has been put forth numerous times by the Kremlin, uh, why they attack. But uh, go ahead, uh, yes. What do you think about Pakistan's role in Afghanistan? Thank you. All right, thank you. And can you pass on the mic right now? Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, free for all, go ahead. Yeah, my question, my question um, can be answered by uh, any of the panelists who would uh, have an answer, of course. Uh, now, given that Eurasia is also one of the most famous uh, geopolitical terms, if we think about heartland versus rimland, and now we obviously have two major players, China and Russia, and against all the predictions, or let's say against the predictions of the majority of experts who were claiming that China and Russia will basically compete over Eurasia. Now it looks like this may turn uh, into the glue of uh, the Dragon Bear. So what is your take about the uh, future of the cooperation uh, on Eurasia? Specifically, of course, I mean Central Asia, and I mean, of course, the connectivity also between Central and South Asia. And are we going to witness also a competition in terms of connectivity because some of the connectivity projects were mentioned? Uh, for instance, India, uh, Iran, uh, then going to uh, Central Asia and to Russia is obviously a competing connectivity project uh, to the BRI. So I would like to hear your opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's round it up. I see one more hand and then we, we'll wrap uh, it. Uh, just last questions. Ali, nice, nice to see you again. Always. Just, just one question. Uh, how many times did you use the word Caspian? Uh, because our official name of the session is that why you're here? You, you, no, no, no. You're it's disappointed. nice idea to discuss P Poland ideas, Czech ideas about Caspian Sea. A lot of uh, uh, tensions between these countries. But uh, the official name of this session, according to my uh, to my English, Guardian of the Caspian Sea. Yeah, and then yes. read on. Yes. How many times did you use this word? Well, I wasn't. I don't no, no, think no, we're, we're checking names. Excuse me. What's that? Yeah. Well, you mentioned it now, so I will throw it to the panel. First time. And then it's the first. That's wonderful. It's that's the first how, name that's of how the cooperation session. works. See so you, sir. There you See go. You, sir. It's understanding everything. See wonderful. You. So, so uh, we did manage to bring in Caspian before the end of the the panel, and uh, as a matter of fact, we have quite a number of. Uh, 
questions, and I'm looking at the time. Not much time left. So starting with you, uh, Mr. Well, Gaspin, see. <laughs> Are we still on this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we let the panelists answer now and then we'll continue this afterwards. Uh, Mr. Mr. Musawi, qu quite a number of questions uh, to you. Please uh, go them through one by one. I know that we have a very less time and Indeed. I, I, I only say that neither country wants to live in a influence of other country. It's uh, very quiet. But the question was the real reason that this a uh, tragic happen in the in uh, in this uh, continent so we are saying that what happened as my co uh, colleague from uzbekistan said that it is better we try to look at the previous uh, previous war so i think that it is better uh, now we try to look uh, look forward to settle the situation to how to uh, find a peaceful way instead of uh, encouraging this side or that side to continue the war. The war is always is a bad for humanity. My country, after f eight years of war with Saddam Hussein, at the end they sit and we sit and talk about peace. Uh, even today, Russia and Ukraine sit and talk about peace is better than tomorrow. About Daesh, I can say that Daesh is a reality in. Uh, Afghanistan, unfortunately, it's created many dangerous and horrible uh, terrorist attack even in recently. And we have, uh, I can say that we have no one Daesh. We have different Daesh. One Daesh are against operating against Shia community. One Daesh is okay, are operating against Central Asia. Another Daesh is operating to uh, China via Uyghur. So I think that in uh, Afghanistan neighboring countries, we reach to this kind of conclusion. How we can uh, surrender the ter terrorists in inside Afghanistan, at the same time we think that Taliban is different from Daesh. So it is better try to assist Taliban against Daesh. And the last question that I think that if there will be another seminar on, uh, on Pakistan, then we can come and talk about the role of Pakistan. Yeah. Wonderful. That's a session at midnight, by the way, uh, on uh, Pakistan. Uh, Elder Aripov, quite a number of questions directed towards you, also with an emphasis on Uzbekistan. Uh, yes, there was a question regarding uh, Uzbekistan interest uh, in the One Belt, One Road project. For us, the main focus in this framework is to build a very important railroad uh, which will connect uh, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan with China. Uh, and uh, uh, we just uh, started negotiations again after a long pause with the Kyrgyz partners, with Chinese partners, and the time is quite good because uh, what uh, our analysis shows that existing capacity uh, already exists the volume which uh, goes through uh, China, um, Central Asia, Russia, and Europe uh, direction. So it gives us uh, a chance uh, right now to uh, uh, to move fast in um, moving forward this project, which will give us the shortest actually way uh, from uh, China to Southern Europe. Uh, it would be 900 kilometers shorter and the delivery time would be uh, you know, reduced by seven to eight days. Uh, there was also a question regarding uh, reaction from the uh, Turkic organization of Turkic state. I, I, uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but there was no one single common statement from this organization. There were separate statements from uh, member states. And uh, regarding uh, connectivity in Afghanistan, I just would like to uh, mention a very important fact. Uh, uh, there was a uh, saying that there are some uh, optimistic, pessimistic views about Afghanistan. I'm quite, quite a bit optimistic. Uh, I think that uh, Afghanistan could really be, uh, could be transformed into, from the buffer zone, traditional buffer zone, to the ANCA regional cooperation could really connect two regions, South 
and Central Asia. And this will bring not only uh, economic benefits, uh, but also create necessary consensus, political consensus, regional consensus on peace economically. This is very important. I believe this could really give a new uh, vision for the whole region. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aripov. Uh, Mr. Saribay, uh, please, uh, some of the questions certainly. Should I give first the floor to Alisa? I'm generally a very sensitive one because we are approaching the last minute. No, don't worry. You're going to get the floor and she's going to get the floor. Indeed? Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. Trust me. I would like to. We have still haven't mentioned Caspian, so. I, we I, I would like to have more yeah. time to. No, to, no to we'll, we'll continue this until someone to says elaborate Caspian. the Caspian yeah. Sea. Yeah. Because it, indeed, uh, yeah. we are I won't let you off the stage unless but, someone says Caspian. But, but, I, but I think that uh, the last summit meeting of uh, Caspian Sea, uh, they, they solved the problem of Caspian. So we, we have no any question anymore, I think. Minister, am I right? Uh, well, uh, I think that's uh, mostly uh, p the questions were uh, answered, uh, except one where is president of Afghanistan. I have yeah. no idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a mystery, isn't it? It's, uh, we'll, we'll keep searching, though, maybe on 60 Minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll check that out. So uh, I would like to uh, welcome the question on Eurasia, Heartland, uh, any other definition, Central Asia, squeezed between uh, big countries, I would again and again turn back to multilateralism. This is the source. This is the key for those who are squeezed between big countries. By the way, the protagonists of multilateralism are not big powers. Why? The middle-sized countries has no capacity to dominate. That is why they are mostly honest they are trying to create the multipolar, the multilateral approaches, not to be very much dependent to their huge, giant neighbors. So this is the key. This is the answer. Why the dream of President Nazarbayev, very young politicians at that moment, were accepted. And today, 27 member states of this initiative celebrating the 30th 30, 30 anniversary. So this is the, 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 the answer to the main question, what would be the future? Future will be multilateral, multipolar. We're advocating that. we desperately wishing that. And I am very happy again to be in India, that multi-alignment, nice, nice concept. And connectivity, competition. We all, knows, no, we all know the market economy rules. Competition brings uh, better services for affordable prices, usually, normally, taking out the inflation rate. So this is the better that my customer in Kazakhstan will have a multiple uh, options to send its goods somewhere, to Vietnam, for instance. I think that uh, BRI is a nice connectivity project. Eurasian economic integration, nice uh, integration process. But we can call all these processes under the one phenomenon, connectivity. Economic connectivity and general connectivity, people-to-people -people contact. So that's again and again we're coming back to the idea of win-win paradigm in the international affairs. I absolutely agree that one day Every war will end. Every war will end with the diplomatic wins. But in order to answer my distinguished colleague from Poland, I'm not advocating any country. If you would be honest with yourself, go to Russia and ask the reasons there. And you will get a lot of maybe reasons. Maybe you will accept some of them. Maybe you will not accept of them. But what is important? The culture of listening to each other, giving opportunity to talk to each other, taking seriously the security concerns, cultural concerns. Why language should be element of division? Why we cannot leave people to uh, have right to speak all languages? 
this is probably it shouldn't be matter of the war yeah so as a human being i'm against strongly against any uh, any violence as diplomat i would prefer diplomatic solution and i'm pretty much sure that this war will end will end in any case but we should see where this what was the reasons mm. and to avoid the new war we should listen to each other this is the, the my, my answer to you i desperately understand your sense uh, we are also very yeah. close to the conflict yeah. and both ukraine and russia were part of is part of my culture for instance sorry for taking no absolutely it's a, it's a very valid point obviously alicia kizakova and in an ideal world indeed there would be no wars we could uh, resolve these differences of opinions through dialogue sadly the reality on the ground of course is a different one P please uh, answer some of the questions th that you uh, see fit i'll specifically answer one question uh, velina chakarova so passionately uh, gave us a chance to uh, answer about her dragon bear uh, concept um, what's interesting for me is that I actually never saw it so black and white that it's only between Russia and China. The more I engage with Central Asia, and especially when the European strategy on Central Asia was being formed, I traveled to Brussels a lot and they invited a lot of speakers from Central Asia who were not Russian or Chinese. And that's where I learned that, you know, it was uh, not very good for uh, them to be grouped always as group of five, and also not very good to impose certain uh, visions of Eurasia or Central Asia, that we did not really spend enough time to see what they were bringing to the table, how they were viewing in a localized sense. And for me, it can never be really one power over or the other, because I see the Central Asian countries have very multivectoral foreign policies and they engage with European Union, with the United States. We have C5 plus one dialogue. European Union has its strategy with them, and they enjoy getting investments from various partners without limiting to certainly only to Russia or China. So I think this we have to consider. And um, another one that uh, I noticed from my experience of being in Central Europe, we have a Visegrad 4 group and it's a bad label sometimes because we might not be in a good group with a country that might have foreign policy in a direct opposition to European Union. So the labels are not always helpful or uh, separating countries. What I wanted to say at the end um, as a positive take from this discussion today, uh, I'm going to slide there. I heard two words today, inclusivity and connectivity. And I think that's what I appreciate about Eurasia and also the Caspian Sea area, um, is that it's very diverse, but also very inclusive. And I think that uh, there is always a way to engage in collaboration if it's not everyone, some countries started and everybody gets on board. And connectivity is something that actually connects all the Western and local partners. Everybody has a connectivity plan, even India, South Korea, Japan, everybody has a connectivity plan in. Central Asia and Eurasia. So we have these ideas. And today I heard so many pragmatic solutions for Afghanistan, and many were about infrastructure and connectivity. And I think that's where we need to pay more attention because I think Mr. Aripo said a very important point. This is not a time to disengage, and it's a time to really actually help be owe it to Afghanistan, I think, yeah. Th thank you so much, indeed, uh, um, uh, Alicia, for these uh, closing uh, remarks. Uh, Mr. Musavi, you, you wrote something. F feel, feel free to, to say it out loud. It's all good. So, so people don't think we're passing Ashraf Ghani address here around. This is. <laughs> <laughs> I think that in the first meeting, that uh, in the first day, uh, night, uh, the ambassador of uh, uh, Afghanistan in Ashraf Ghani's time. He explained where is Mr. Ghani, and I think that if somebody participates in that, uh, knows very well. I on the for the conclusion, I want to say that it was good opportunity for this uh, for this meeting that with we could raise the issue of Afghanistan, and we are saying that it is necessary never forget Afghanistan. Forgetting uh, Afghanistan is a dangerous for the region. And also, if it is anything is for the region, it is against the global. 
I, we never forget what happened after Soviet Union. We never for, forget uh, what happened in 2001. It is better try to normalize the situation in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Th thank you, and indeed, uh, deciphering, we were tasked with uh, deciphering the geopolitics of Eurasia, and I can tell you that this would be a difficult challenge and task uh, for any panel, uh, for any speakers, but I think, and I speak for all the fellows here, uh, you've all done a remarkable job uh, within the short amount of time that was given to us considering the vast region that we're talking about here. I think this was highly informative. Um, a very, very, uh, very substantive discussion. Uh, thanks to you that uh, we had here with many positive outcomes, and I think that's very fitting since this, if I believe, is indeed the final, final discussion of the Rizina Dialogue 2022 as far, I know the fellows will continue on after tomorrow, but as far as the stage work is concerned. So, Syed Rasul Musavi, Alicia Kizekova, Kairat Saribai, Eldor Aripov, and as, of course, in absentia, Francois and Nicolas, who's probably on the plane right now. Thank you so much for a wonderful panel. Thank you so much for a wonderful...